So let's just uh, recap. So uh, let me just talk about where where I'm coming from on the stream. So I mean, this is the folknology stream. So it isn't um, my storm specific, although we do cover um, all the my storm stuff because that's what I work on a lot of lot of the time, and I work with people from the my storm community, people like Laurie, for example. So um, uh, I tend to talk about the work that's ongoing, uh, the boards that we're designing for MyStorm, the software around MyStorm, the open source tool chains for the FPGA, um, Yosis Next PNR, MyStorm, all of that kind of stuff. And we also talk about different combinations of technologies on boards, including the microcontroller stuff. Um, more recently, we've been looking into um, the RP2040, which is Raspberry Pi's new chip on which they based the Pico. And we've been kind of de deconstructing that over the last uh, few streams. So we're going to do a bit more of that. Um, luckily, Laurie's here as well. We're going to talk about some of the Verilog he's written um, and try and go through some of that stuff. But let's do the community stuff first. So let me get that back up. So uh, first on the list, hold on. Get the right window up. Is the, um, I should give you the, um, the URL for the MyStorm forum. Because um, we kind of continue the discussions down in the forum when we're talking about any MyStorm products or projects, the community, or the software development around it, things like the PIO. Um, more recently, um, I've added in something else. So if you're not here, or you've not been to um, Discord area before, let me give you where we are starting to talk. So this is quite new. I've had this for a little while, but I didn't want uh, too much traffic down there. So I could actually get on with stuff. But if you want to join our Discord, um, that's a pretty good place for finding me and the projects and bits and pieces that we're working on. There's an area there at the moment dedicated to the PIO stuff as well. PIO deconstruction. Um, so if, you, if you're a Discord user, that's, that's where to go. If you're not a Discord user and you want to find out, then probably worth checking out as well. Um, for those that used to know IRC, Discord is quite similar. It's like a modern version of that, really. It's a place where you've got a lot of real-time chat. So let me just put that to one side because we might need that. Um, next, I want to talk about um, the open source tool chain stuff, and in particular, let's let's take a look at this. So Pepin. Um, I just did a tweet today that I think is very relevant that we should mention. So let me just show you that. Let me see if I can get the um, get the page up as well. Browser.
I just really summarize this. Uh, can I crop this maybe? Uh, control. Right. Hold on, let's just bring myself forward. There we go. Right. Um, so, um, uh, Pepin announced today that um, he's resigned from Symbiotic EDA, primarily because of one of the guys that operates this. I'm not going to start giving them more oxygen by saying who they are and how you can find them. If you have take a look at these threads, you will see. Um, this isn't the first time um, that the person that we're talking about here has, you know, said things that we really disagree with. It's in his nature, I think, and that's the trouble. But anyhow, Pepin said he's resigning today, um, but the work he does is really, really important. Um, particularly, he's been working on porting the GoWin uh, semiconductor FPGAs to the open source FPGA toolkit to next PNR etc so um, it definitely support him um, you can actually do that on github here or you can do it on patreon which is where I support him as well so let's just make sure that he gets rewarded for doing the right thing uh, on this front. Because um, I think what he's done is very important and he needs the support and he's doing a fantastic job with, um, I think it's called Project Apicula. I think it's Apicula he pronounces it, which is basically the, the um, doing all the background work to get Next Pointer, uh, sorry, Next PNR working well with the GoWin chips. Um, he's already got a lot of it working. He's been working on it for some time. So it's pretty important stuff. So do support Pepin um, if you can. Um, very important. Um, on the open source toolchain front, um, we found someone else, um, a chap called Kian, who is working on the um, Lattice Mac X, uh, X02s, which are kind of almost um, uh, CPLD territory, although it's difficult to um, tell. For oh, it's the wrong one. Sorry, bear with me. We'll do you in a minute, William. Excuse me. Put the wrong thing in here. There we go. So yeah, William D. Jones, where he's just announced. Uh, okay, I'm ready to announce the Mac X02 family of FPGAs now has full FOS flow in Verilog to Bitstream. Um, I'm not sure what that means in terms of maturity. I should imagine it's a first pass at it, a bit like Apicula was for the Go Wins, you know, this time last year, really. Um, but again, this is really good stuff because um, those are quite handy FPGAs, and a number of people had been um, waiting for that, uh, including, I believe, um, Scott um, at Adafruit, so he can fulfil his. Uh, Mac X02 FPGA fantasy in Circuit Python. No excuse now, Scott. Um, has he got a link? Yeah, he talks about it. It's a bit complicated. Uh, if you wish to try this yourself, you need some forks, and then he's got a fork for Yosis, 
next PNR and his um, I presume that's his P oh yeah project trellis okay number of things are broken right now but enough works to root blinky so I couldn't resist while I fix things so yeah he's still got a lot to do uh, it's not exactly mainstream yet but you know well done for getting this far already um, and there's lots of lots and lots of positive comments on that as well it's really good news we like that more chips to choose from in the open source FPGA support family so that was a great bit of news as well right um so that was william now kian i saw him was posting today which is quite interesting he's um he's done a um so he's using the black eyes mx and he posted on twitter today again um that he's just done uh some verilog for the sd ram another sd ram controller which he treats like a dual port I haven't seen it yet because I don't think he's published it, but he is showing this, which is quite interesting. And he's saying all sorts of good things about our products, which we love about the MySQL community, etc. So he's showing his demo there is it actually looks for shorted pins as well, or, or pins that don't give back what they should do on the memory. And his state machine actually stops when he discovers it. I like the way he's he's um, put all the uh, those digilent like LED P mods in there, so he can output the state of different things. That's quite cool. I also notice on the left he's got uh, Peter's you know uh, dip switches P mod and the um, seven segment P mod as well, which is nice. So that's very cool um lots of people like this and retweeted this oh yeah oh he has posted now cool hold on let's have a look There it is. Oh, what's happened to his vid there? It's kind of gotten stretched. Um, docs. Hmm. Yeah, this looks nice. Right, I'm not going to go through all of that now. But we need to revisit that. Very cool. What license has he put here? Yeah, it's open source. Cool. That's good. Is that blind drive on the ULX3 Gitter? Okay, discussion of hyper on there. I wouldn't know. Well, I do. I I am listed on that ULX3 Gitter, but I just don't have time to go there at the moment. Everything else happening. Q. I like his pick. right so that's that what else did we pick up on the way this evening oh yes bruno levy it's quite good he's designed a risk 5 core in less than 1280 gates which is nice
kind of crammed that uh, he's using the 1k chip the um you know the what do they call it the lattice ice uh oh yeah there it is you can see it on the bottom the ice stick which has the 1k hx 1k chip you can see he's filled it quite well <laughs> at the next p if you look at the next pnr um visualization there you go there's all the cells but that's pretty impressive getting it into uh, less than you know 1280 lookup tables don't forget they're four bit lookup tables as well because it's one of the um, lattice hx series chips that's very cool what he's done there How good your French? So it is on the ice stick. Uh, the LED, OLED LED setup driving an ST thirteen fifty one. Example using examples from Adafruit. Um, live cable. Hmm. He's got the. Um, this is the um, yeah. This is the repo. Um, DSP eight bit says, how do you see the OS toolchain status? What do you think are the main challenges for OSS toolchain development boards? I came from a Quartus and Xilinx IDs due to my work. That is why I have not been able to get involved. Um, I mean, uh, we. You know, in the stuff that we work on, the community, it's all open source. So it's all based around Yosis, Next PNR, etc. Um, there is work being done on the Xilinx stuff as well, which is the Project X ray version, um, although I haven't had an update on the status. As for the, the, um, Quarter stuff is that is that for the Intel chips? The quarters I forget I get mixed up now. I think somebody was looking into that. I mean Xilinx definitely on its way um, for the newer chips. You know the Artex, Artex and um, Vertex chips. That's what Project X Ray is all about. Um, but yeah, it works very well. And you don't forget DSP8, but you've also got um, the Simbi Flow stuff as well, which is kind of cool that uh, Claire has done, which is really nice. If you want to do your um, provers, etc. So actually, it's pretty good quality. Now, some people would um, perhaps debate some of that. Uh, people like uh, Sylvain at TNT, who likes to be able to root his own. In fact, he's got his own scripts where he runs the stuff so he can modify certain parts of placement to make them better. But we're not all quite as genius as uh, Sylvain. <laughs> but he uses the open source toolkits. So it's actually pretty good now. It's been the first, the first, um, first one, first time I ever used Yosis was back in 2015. So it's come a long way since then. Um, but as I said, I'm not sure on the Intel side what they're doing. I know the Xilinx side does have this Project X-Ray, although I couldn't tell you the status of that. 
So different manufacturer chips are being tackled in by different people. Um, there's a lot of fuzzing that has to go on to work out inside how all the pieces fix together and what the bit streams look like and all that kind of thing. It, uh, it takes quite a long time and a certain sort of mindset. But yeah, I mean, primarily it's really lattice stuff is very popular right now. Gerwin's coming on. Um, we know the project that there's Project Apicula, and then we know Project X Ray is working on the Xilinx Vertex and Artex side of things. Um, I'm trying to think who would know. Tim Mifro, T Mifro might know the answer to the status of that, or Claire maybe, or David Shah might know what the status of Project X Ray is. I don't know if he's working on that himself, but um, he certainly he works with most of those folks um, I post what you saying was going to use an ECP5 but then decided on a try on is this is this one of your products uh, projects um, I post Silica, the affordable and easiest path for risk five. Nope, it was a tweet a few days ago. I, I didn't see this. Harness the power of risk five and design your very own tailored system. So, what is this? The Firefly. Oh, wait a minute. Have I did I mention this? Uh, I signed up for updates and they responded with this. Firefly is being depreciated for a more advanced design that combines a dual core STM ARM microcontroller with an Ethnix, Ethnix T120 FPGA. We'll let you know when that is ready. We are aiming for spring 2021 release. Thank you so much for your interest. Let me know if you have any questions. So is this for developing RIS-5? Is that what this is? Is it open source though? Mostly for 3D GPU research. Okay. Hmm. Graphics and 3D. Um, yeah, I don't know what the try on is. Is that used for chip development specifically? Is that one of those higher end um, jobbies? It's not something I have experience with. Um, yeah. Okay, so the uh, other thing I was going to mention is Luke Wren. Does everyone know Luke Wren? He's been doing a lot of the uh, Pico work, by the way, at Raspberry Pi. And more importantly, we have a few tabs here. He's working on an interesting new board, which is an interesting combination. Um, as IPO says, yes, the Pico Station 3D. Um, if you can get to here, he talks about it here. 
So on this board, he's got an ICE 40 up 5K in the QFN 48 package. Um, which is that. that. And he's connecting that to the um, RP 2040, i.e. Raspberry Pi, uh, new chip, new microcontroller. And I'm guessing this U5 on the right hand side here, that looks like um, Hyper RAM to me. Either a Windbound or a Cypress. Um, single Hyper RAM. So that's quite a cool board. He's also obviously got an SD card on there. He's got a HDMI connector, USB. USBs obviously connected to Raspberry Pi. Sorry, the RP2040. Cut the buttons. Is that a crystal? No, that's the RAM, I guess. That will be the flash for the uh, 2040. That's the crystal there. And an LDO regulator, or, or um, yes, yeah, an LDO regulator, this one. Not like the Pico, which has a boost on it. Um, and obviously, he's got some uh, some a, a footprint holes for um, those uh, larger game controller connectors. So clearly he's got his eyes on using this for retro type applications. In fact, he probably says something. Hold on. I push my RP2040 plus ICE40 UP5 games console thing to get up. There you go. It's a games console thing. Uh, maybe one day I'll get around to actually bringing up the board. Seems like there's a lot of fun to be had with the RP2040 up 5K and HDMI sockets and S NES controllers. I concur. So that's going to be some fun. And what did he say? He did mention what he was going to do. Yeah, he was talking about using a parallel control between, you know, like an 8 bit parallel port type control from the um, RP2040 to the uh, UP 5K. In fact, you can see it here as well as providing the clock just the same way as we do on Black Eyes products and etc. So that's kind of good. I quite like that. That looks kind of interesting. Hey, talks a bit more here. Look, this is an unfinished, untested project to develop a 3D games console based on the RP2040 microcontroller and an ICE40 plus up 5K FPGA, board schematic data sheet. Data sheets from left to right, yeah. TRS jack, uh, status LED, micro SD card, micro USB socket, downline and serial console 2040, status LED for the FPGA, HDMI socket for the DVID video output. Um, <clears throat> the bottom has two SNES control sockets also the board is eight megabit mega is that megabyte I think he means hyper RAM catch the FPGA there's a reset and boot select for the 2040 and SWD as you are on the header there are 12 wires connecting the FPGAs of the microcontroller, one of them going from GP out clock to the output of the RP2040 to GB in global clock input on the up 5K. Yep. Intention here is to use these for an 8-bit parallel bus with a free running clock, a valid ready handshake and an IRQ line. And for the up 5K to derive its internal clocks from the bus clock. That means, well, if, he's, if you're using the same clock for the bus the trouble is with doing that is you have to keep the clock running normally you have a control signal uh, for the data exchange 
um, which when activated, you then activate the clock rather than having the clock running all the time. But I suppose you could get away with doing that. It saves you one pin. Um, it's quite a power hungry way of doing it, though. I would have thought. I regret that. Um, No external uh, flash for the um, up 5k. So it's always configured from the um, 2040. Board use cases run everything, including graphics routines on the RP2040 and use the up 5k as a parallel to DVID bridge. Okay, run everything including soft process running up 5k and use the RP2040 as a surprisingly cost effective USB serial bridge. Yeah, we know all about doing that, don't we? As well as for firmware upload, you'll need some kind of shell running on the RP2040 to provide audio and control port access for the FPGA. The, uh, uh, the, uh, did, has he, how did he connect the SNES controllers? Do those go to the FPGA or do they go to the PK? Sorry, the RP2040. I think they go to the RP2040. Um, looking at it, the connections here go that way, so it's halfway in between this, which is the same as this connector here. So those come up here and go to the 2040. So I think the SNE ES controllers actually go to the Pico, then sorry, to the 2040. Um one game logic audio controller access to SD cards on the 2040. Put all the graphics in the hardware up 5K. Yeah. Run 3D vertex side of operations on the 2040 and put 3D fragment side hardware on the FPGA. Project status. I've laid out first iteration of the board and have soldered up a prototype, but haven't had a chance to bring the board up or any firmware. Now, I should imagine you are busy doing the RP2040 itself. There are questionable decisions in the schematic in particular. The power chain violates the UP5K sequencing requirements. You may be all right there. It's quite flexible. So you shouldn't copy what you see here, but I'll be posting this anyway. Might you pause someone for now? Do, do, do. You can find proof of concept for direct DVI output from the UP5K here in this repo. Uh, that's it. One of his repos, actually. I've also managed to squeeze the wrist boy plus DVI output onto a up 5k. Cool. I think we looked at that last week, didn't we, Laurie? And I post. Still need to push that code, but you can see a video of it tweeted. Um, this shows you fit plenty of graphics in the hardware in the wrist 5 processor. Why is up 5k generates DVID signals? Just to remind you, let's have a look. Pretty sure that this is what we looked at last week. There was a bit more detail, that's cool. But yeah, we showed the animation here, which is very cool. Um, and in case you wanted that link, I should post that. Quite a bit of feedback on that. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, let me just catch up on the chat. Uh, yeah, Laurie is just saying there is too much interesting stuff at the moment to keep up with. Yeah, I know that feeling. I know that very well, Laurie. There is a lot going on, which is cool. Mind you, it's the start of a new year and lots of people are in lockdown, etc. Lots of time on their hands in the evenings. Uh, 
Um, so that's Luke's. We've covered that. Let me see what else we've got. Um, oh, Scott did some more deep dives. Did another deep dive uh, last Friday, in case you missed it, where he went in deeper on the Raspberry Pi Pico in the 2040 um, from the circuit pipe and point of view, really. Um, so uh, that's worth watching. So that's his stream. Um, the announcement there. And this was the um, YouTube recording of that stream. But make sure you don't watch that until after you, this stream is finished. <laughs> of course, as if you would. Um, there we go. Um, that finishes our little community news and my storm community bits, I think. Anyone else got anything else to add? That they want us to look at before we move on to the deep dive into um, the RP2040 PIOs. Anyone got anything for us to look at? Woo! More tea, Vicar. It's getting cold now. How are we doing? Crikey, we're nearly an hour in already. Oh, um, I post said the stream crashed at some point. I didn't even notice it had done that. It didn't actually tell me for some reason. Apologies if that was the case. You won't see this obviously on the recording. Anyone else see it? My post is untaped, tapped, taped. Yeah, it's all recorded for prosperity, I'm afraid. It gets dumped up on YouTube, transcoded at some point after the stream. Uh, Laurie saw it as well, so you're not alone, I post. It's not your end. Just having a look at my frames, what's it saying? Frames missed due to rendering lag, 49. Frames due, lost, frames, skip frames due to encoding lag, zero. So maybe it's that, so maybe it's just a rendering thing, which is, but that suggests it's my end. It's not a bandwidth issue, which is interesting. Yeah, those meddling kids, more like my meddling applications. I've got quite a lot running here. I've got OBS running. This is only on a laptop, by the way, although it's a fairly powerful one. Um, uh, with some good graphic stuff in it. Um, yeah, I'm running OBS. I'm running the Discord app. I'm running iStudio. I'm running... PyCharm, I'm running uh, Google Chrome, which takes enormous amounts of memory. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> right, so if no one's got anything else on the news and community front, let's move into the main thing, I guess, given my tea's finished. We should do a refresh. Where were we last? Right, last week. Right, let me get um, let's get this browser out of the way. We don't need that. Oh, I should show. Yeah, let's remind ourselves. Let's work backwards here. Ah, so we were working from the data sheet, weren't we originally? And in particular. Damn PIOs and dastardly PIOs. Let's 
a couple of key diagrams we were using last week. Uh, can I get rid of this? Come on. How do you get rid of this bloody... What's your name? Menu, okay. Fair enough. So this is the uh, overall um, picture of the arrangement for the PIOs. And this is actually doubled up uh, on both sides. So what you've got here is four state machines. And I want to come back to that term, probably towards the end. Remind me. I think that's wrong. Wrong terminology here. I think they're much more deserving than this. They are deceptively named. Um, so each state machine has a pair of FIFOs. It has a TX and an RX FIFO to exchange um, data to and from either memory or DMA, the application running in either C or Python. Um, you know, on the any either of the cores of the um, uh, M0 plus cores that are in the RP2040. Then on the right hand, right hand side here, you've got the um, I/O mapping that muxes the outputs from the state machines onto the GPIO pins. Um, in addition to that, you've got a small amount of memory which you can write to here, which holds instructions, 32 instructions to be precise. Um, and if you remember, we'll come back to this in a second. Those instructions, do I have a list here? Oh, we'll come back to that. Damn, man. Ooh. Sorry, from too far. Okay, that's the diagram. This is the instruction set. So you effectively write your program, your PIO program, uh, in this very small set of code, um, of which there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine instructions, is it? Um, a jump, a wait, an input, an output, push and pull. Uh, which are used for the FIFOs, move, which are used in a combination of different things, IRQs, which you can raise to notify the processors, and possibly as an inter-communication between the state machines, although I need to look more into that, and a set instruction for actually um, setting registers, such as uh, the scratch registers, etc. Um, so the, it's a very small set of instructions that annoyingly don't add up to eight. There's actually nine. So if you look at the way that these are coded, sorry, if you look at 13, 14, and 15, i.e. the most significant three bits, these determine what the instruction is, except in the case of push and pull, which have identical um, digits. And you have to de delve in deeper here to uh, the eighth bit to see which one it is which is frustrating. It makes the instruction decoding look um, a lot less simple than it should do. But there you go. Um, but a very simple set of instructions. Um, the odd bit is really kind of what's in bit positions um, 9 through to 13 um, because um, you have this side set ability slash delay. Um, 
this means that you can do more than one thing at once. So a typical application would be, say I'm setting an output on something like SPI. Not only do I want to change that output, but I also want to be able to change the clock at the same time. So by having these side sets, it means that you can make two changes at once, um, which gives you the flexibility that you need. So you've got these uh, side set stuff going on here that can also be used as delay or can be used with both. And the way that that's encoded makes the entire thing extremely complex, really, compared to decoding normal instructions. Um, but if you were to ignore that middle bit, it just looks like a normal instruction setup to a degree. Um, so if you just ignore these bits. However, we don't ignore that. We have to do all that and deal with the complications. So even though it's a very simple set of instructions, the complications are actually quite, quite high when it comes to implementation. It's kind of got a wide instruction, if you like, rather than a, it's kind of the opposite. Even though it's a reduced instruction set, each instruction can be much wider because of these side sets and delays, as well as a few other things. But it's actually a very simple table when you think about it. That doesn't mean that it's that simple to implement, as you will see. Uh, but more importantly, so if we dive into, remember those state machines, hold on, should have had a marker here, shift registers, some instructions, yes, Let's, there's some examples here where you can see a simple sample code, just to remind you, here we go, square wave program. Um, so we set one pin to output, so that's an initial set, it's only done once. And then we're in this assembly loop, jump again, two again. And that's um, here what we're doing is we're setting the pin to one. Uh, and this is actually a delay in the brackets here. So we're setting the pin to one and we're holding for one clock cycle in addition. Then we're setting pins to zero and we're going to jump again. So what you'll find is you've got a high period here that's twice as long as the off period but you've effectively got a square wave or rectangular wave very simple this can be written more effectively you can get rid of the jumps etc by using what's called a wrap where it assumes the last instruction uh, it goes back to the first instruction so there's all sorts of tricks you can do there uh, with the settings um, to make even shorter programs. You can actually get quite good value out of that relatively small number of uh, instructions, i.e. 32 in memory. Sorry, okay. let me check my messages here. Uh, I post human. I actually did that with my CPU, lol. What did you do? Sorry, I missed that one. Um, my branch instruction uses 2-bit to determine which type of branch. That's not that embarrassing. Um, you can do it lots of different ways. Uh, Laurie said uh, square because JMP takes one cycle. Oh, of course, sorry, forgive me. Yes, I wasn't including that. If it was wrapped, then that wouldn't be the case. But yeah, you're right, the jump. So what Laurie's saying here is this jump takes one clock cycle. So that takes one clock cycle, setting it to zero, and then it stays at zero for another clock cycle before it goes around. Very good. Thank you. My bad. Um, so what was I going to do? Yeah. So this is the important diagram then. So remember, we had multiple state machines here so one two three four and this again the whole thing is replicated on the other side so you've actually got twice as many but on here inside each one of those state machines is this nice little diagram uh so forgetting the control logic for a moment um you've got a program counter that's what the pc is here so that's the thing that it iterates through the instructions you're going to need that you also got something called a clock div this is actually a fractional clock division. So it divides the incoming clock rate by whatever um, and enables you to get the board rate that you may want if you're doing a UART or SPI or anything else. So it enables you to divide that incoming clock down. So the, the rate at which those instructions go and what each delay means is determined by that clock division setup. 
Um, then you've got an in shift and an out shift. I'll come back to that in a second. You've got two scratch registers. Scratch registers are simply 32-bit registers, one called X, one called Y. And you can use that to store stuff that you may manipulate or bring in, bring out, etc. The in and out shifts are actually fairly clever because they interface with um, the FIFOs and or GPIOs indirectly. And they're a bit more complex. Quite interesting how they've broken this down, and you do wonder, is it like that on the inside? Or is this a simplification in many ways? Is there artistic license in the way that they've broken things down here? So for example, this whole square on the outside is effectively what they're calling a state machine. I have a real issue with that, because to me, this isn't a state machine. This is more like a micro core of some sort, or a nano core, um, because it's got a program counter, etc., etc. Um, I think calling it a state machine is a misdemeanor and it confuses me terribly uh, from a naming point of view, particularly when we're using state machines at low level to represent the logic. Um, you know, um, what is control logic, for example? That's just like, oh, and everything else. Maybe that's what that is. Um, but you also got some other outputs here for the IRQ clears and status. You've got the instructions from the memory or bus, it says here, to go into the control logic. So um, what we started doing last last stream was actually looking, trying to decompose this somewhat. Now, um, we were using iStudio, so I'm going to use iStudio again. Um, we're perhaps stretching it to its absolute uh, limits here, really, because it's not a good tool for this. Uh, from a design point of view, I mean, it is quite a good tool for showing you visually how things are connected, which is why I've got it here. Let me see if I can find where we got to last week, because I think we started building some basic blocks. Um, I don't know if I actually saved what we did. Yeah, it's kind of like that. So here we had, right, hold on, let me get this on the screen so that you guys can see it. Uh, there we go. And let me just move this as well. So we kind of got here and we had two scratch registers and a shift, shift in, I think that was. And then we had our uh, our um, program counter, whatever. Um, and if I look at these, then we're also getting this problem of not being able to edit this stuff very well. So it was all very basic at this point, small conjectural ideas. Now, anyhow, subsequent to that, I've been working on an MMIGEN version, which isn't working yet. Um, and we may look at that next week, possibly. I doubt we're going to have time today at the rate we're going. Um, meanwhile, Laurie has been working um, at a real clip and has put together a very long version of the PIO, deconstructed PIOs, which is really good. And he's running tests and things on it as well. So it's, hooray, well done, you know, super. So I've been um, watching him do that and watching all of the um, commits, watching his repo on that. And so what we're going to do now is have a look at some of that code. So what I want to do here actually is let's start a new um, so this is going to be fun. I don't know how this, how this is going to work out. So what I did earlier is I took some of that code that, um, some of that Verilog that um, Laurie's produced, and let's save this. What should we call this? Uh, PIO. I'll give it a date. I think. So we're a three o two twenty one stream. So we can identify what this was. Uh, 
Um, Uh, Laurie's just saying my Verilog version now runs in simulation and on Black Ice MX and the ULX3. That's really cool. So that's since yesterday. I haven't pulled since yesterday. I haven't pulled from the repo, so I haven't seen those changes. That's very good. So what I did was with the version that I had of Laurie stuff. Um, I tried to take some of that. Oh, can I just change? Hold on. This is weird. Why is it going over there? Bear with me a sec. I'm just changing the sizings of my windows here. This may be a problem anyhow, fitting everything in. I'm just trying to maximize what we've got. So I've taken some of the base parts of the blocks uh, sorry of the verilog and we can actually look at the verilog as well um so that i can show them as blocks in iStudio um unfortunately i will say that the more i use iStudio the more baffled i become about how you're meant to operate this thing i'm clearly trying to do things with it that you shouldn't do or i'm doing it in the wrong way um i i think it's a useful visualization tool um but whenever i try and do any project stuff on it i, I tend to fall over but anyhow bearing that in mind so let's bring in some blocks uh so what i've done is i've taken so what should we start with what's probably the easiest let's, let's do with the uh, scratch register so we've got two of those one is um let's just have a look at this so we've got uh, uh yes so this is now updated with um with um Laurie's code so um cool so let's just bring in another one of those so we're going to need two of those so we're effectively trying to recreate here um, what we're going to need to create what they refer to as a state machine okay because this is the other thing is one of the other things that I was um, pondering about is how you create instances quite often you know if you create them I mean what you can't do just to show you what I mean right say I was take uh, the scratch register um, so if I was to take Laurie's uh, Verilog and create a new code block, right? Called, um, so say this was my scratch block. I'm sorry. You may find my stream going up and down a little bit. Even though OBS isn't warning me, I am seeing some red lines on the frame rates. So bear with me. Um, so I was to create a code block. Right. Let's not put anything in for the moment. I need to put one in because otherwise it complains. So it's so half clock, right? Now, if I go and put that code block down, right, and paste in code. So here's the module for the scratch register because I want to create a block 
an iStudio that I can reuse, right? So if I put that in as is, then I go to verify it. Boom. It won't do it because module definition, scratch, scratch, <laughs> we got company, incoming cat. Um, so what it's saying here is the module definition scratch cannot nest into module main underscore v eight o three two six e. So what it's saying um, is that you can't embed a module inside a block. So that's very frustrating. Um, a block in iStudio is like a module. So effectively what you're saying is you've got a block that has a block inside it, potentially, right? Um, so when I want to create these blocks in order to do the stream, I have to decompose these blocks. I have to take all the module stuff out. So effectively, I've got to put that, enter that into the areas uh, of the block creation parameter fields manually, and then just put in this part inside the module as the code. So let's just get rid of that. We do, let's do our Blue Peter thing. For those UK lockdowners. Uh, so if we look in this, if you look at that, the only code in this scratch register here is the insides of the module, not the module itself. And then when you define all these IOs, uh, I can't double click on this for some reason because it's actually it's locked. Yeah. So you have to manually reproduce all the inputs and outputs and type those in so it's painstaking um, this is a relatively small module so it's not that difficult so that's the first thing when you're trying to use iStudio to do this when you you're actually trying to use your proper Verilog um, you've got all sorts of things that get in the, in the way okay make that a bit smaller uh, the other problem that you're going to have is how do you instantiate another module? So quite often you'll have a module and then you'll be instantiating modules within that smaller modules and connecting up the inputs and outputs to that. Uh, and again, you can't easily do this in here because what you do in iStudio is you have these blocks and you manually connect them together. So it's a bit strange in that way but anyhow what i've done is i've recreated his his uh, modules uh Lloyd's modules uh and painstakingly drawn these up here so that we can actually connect these later so let, let let's look at that so we've got uh these are the scratch registers the other thing we're going to need so you need two scratch registers see i don't even know can you actually name these that's the other thing that's annoying i don't think there's any easy way of naming this um, which is a shame. Um, then we're going to need to add in a program counter. Go down here. Just check that's the new one. Yep. Come back to that in a second. The other thing we're going to need is two shifters. And we're going to need a clock divider uh, as a block. And we've got the so all of these I've recreated as blocks effectively, so we can go and look at them. 
So there we are recreating our, um, effectively recreating our state machine that you see here on the right hand side. I haven't got the control bit in there yet. I do have an object for that, but it's complicated. And the other thing that we do have as well, I'm not going to add this on yet, but you can add in the uh, FIFO blocks. So in this case, we'd be adding in two of these. But these are actually outside the state machine at this point. So none of this is permanent. It's just for um, so that we can see how these um, kind of fit together, really. And then we can go in and examine uh, the various components. Right. Um, okay, let me just look at my rates here. Doesn't say any frames have been missed, which is interesting. Or well, only says 49, which is the same as it said before. So hopefully I haven't dropped out completely at your end. I do see it going down a bit. Hmm. It's just gone down now. Now I'm only using like 12% of the CPU, so it's not that. Maybe this is a bandwidth one. Bear with me a sec, let me just check what everyone else is doing, make sure they're not using all the bandwidth. Hold on a sec. Okay, everyone seems to be innocent, strangely. I shall continue. Right, so have a, let's have a look at the individual pieces here. So remember that the scratch registers are really just storage local storage for the state machine um, X and Y the clock div really just takes the clock and divides it by the amount we specified in the program um, as a config um, to the program PC counter steps through the instructions which it gets from the memory and then the two shifters either shift things in from the uh, memory subsystem, DMA, etc., from the cores or out to them, or shifts towards the I.O. So let's have a look at the simple thing first. Let's look at how, how we've constructed, or in fact how Laurie's constructed the scratch register, because this is probably the simplest thing to start. I do apologize with this formatting. I don't know if we can do this. No, we can't do that. That's annoying. Let's just get it even. No, it won't let me move that. Right, whatever. So um, we've got a 32 bit register, um, which was referred to with the label. VAL or value, short for value. Um, and the first thing we're doing here is we're assigning the data output to that value. So an assign is really just a, a constant wiring, if you like, of one thing to the other. It's combinational logic. It's not synchronous or clocked logic. So it's continuous, effectively. So I know as D out will always equal whatever 
value is at that time. So if value changes, D out changes immediately, barring some delays in the um, logic itself. Um, then we have basically a synchronous um, piece of logic. So all of this is done relative to the positive edge of the clock. And all of the logic will do that, with the exception, I think, of some of the um, config stuff that sets up the um, simulation, for example. Um, this is a fairly standard thing. So if we've got a reset signal, what we're going to do is we're going to set the value to zero. So it's just a courtesy thing to zero out the eternal value of that register. Otherwise, um, when we're getting a clock signal, um, I'll come back to that in a second, and we are not stalled or there is no stall currently in place, we will then process this. So what does that mean? So the P enable is, sorry, the P enable stands for clock, uh, P clock, i.e. PIO clock enable. So what that, that's created by the divider in order to um, create a divided clock signal. So only when that's high will we be able to do things. So we're, we're, we're effectively not running at full clock speed, but we're running at the P-enable speed. Um, and the stall, it can happen for a number of different reasons, and we'll probably come back to that in a bit. But assuming that we're enabled and we are not stalled, um, what we can do is we can read. So uh, if we see a signal called set, um, which comes from the controller in our little state diagram. And it's this input here. So when when we see this go high, i.e. when we check it on every enabled clock cycle, we will read in the values from this 32-bit data line. That's 32 lines here, D in. And we will copy the contents we will transfer, yeah, copy the contents into the value register, the AL register. Otherwise, if the set line isn't high, what we do is if the decrement line is high, we will actually reduce the value in of the current contents of the value register by one. So we will set, we will basically calculate in logic the value that's currently in the register minus one and that will then be um, clocked back into the register itself which is the equivalent to a decrement type instruction so there's two real things that the uh, um, scratch register can do we can have a value set into it or we can have whatever the value that was in there decremented to a new value and we can obviously read the contents of that register by looking at the output which is on the right hand side in this case on the D out uh, 32 lines effectively 32 bit output register so it's a very simple bit of error log uh, and I don't know quite um, what our level of uh, knowledge is for everyone viewing the stream but anyhow but that's quite a nice simple piece of Verilog. Verilog is the code if you like or the language which we which is being used here to define how the logic is constructed inside say the FPGA chip or in a simulation of, of the logic. Um, at the moment we're kind of interested in the simulation but um, we'll also be able to produce um, in this, um, synthesis is synthesis we will be able to synthesize sorry this logic in real uh, FPGA chips on boards such as the Black Ice MX for example or the ULX3 which uh, Laurie's done both of those in this case so that's a very simple one so that's that's how our scratch register works and how it's defined um, so you can see the other lines here coming in that do the control. So you've got the clock line coming in here. 
you've got the enable for the clock, i.e. the divided clock value combination. Uh, you've got a reset line coming in, which we are, we're accounting for here when we want to reset the value zero. And then you've got a stored line. So when, when the stored line is high, that means it is actually stored. So it shouldn't be accepting any set or decrement um, instructions. It shouldn't be responding to those if it's stored. Okay, Because when we're stored, we need to pause the machine, the state machine, effectively. And we don't want it doing these things. Otherwise, it would get out of sync with everything else. And there's a number of things that can cause a stall, um, such as empty... FIFOs or full FIFOs possibly on the way out or things like a wait instruction. I'm sure there's more as well. Uh, Laurie can probably give us um, any other instances. So that's our scratch registers. And we use those really for state. Storing local state when we're doing our PIO programs in, in this tiny or nano instruction language. So we've got two of those. One is normally called X, one is normally called Y. So when you look at the code um, instructions, you will see set X, set Y. Um, what should we do yet? Let's have a look at the clock division. That's quite an interesting thing. So the, that P enable is being generated by the clock. Uh, oh. Very interesting. It's not in there. Let me go get it. Let me go get it, man. I'll show you what it should be. Maybe I pulled the wrong divider in. Clock reset div 23. Enable. Yeah, I think it's right. Let me unlock that. I did say there may be some teething problems. It was done in a bit of a hurry today. My prep, trying to mangle iStudio into what we want. So there's your code. This is the Verilog that represents the uh, divide. Let me go from there. Right, so the inputs we have are clock reset and the um, amount that we wish to divide by in this case it's a 24 bit wide divider that's actually been corrected hasn't it Laurie? is that actually 64 bit now Laurie? after your research today on min and max frequencies don't forget i've got your copy not from today but from yesterday let me know um, so no it should be 24 bits okay cool so um, the div counter because what we need to do is count up and down in order to do our division here so that's a 32-bit register inside in this case so here is a synchronous block again you can always tell it's a synchronous block because you have this at the top. So in other words, whenever there's a new clock positive edge of a clock cycle, that's when we do our uh, logical evaluation. We got the same kind of reset signal. So in other words, when we're setting it up, when we get a hardware reset in through this line, we're going to reset the counter to zero and we're going to make sure that uh, the clock enable is at one. Okay um which defaults to having a divide by one um otherwise if we're not in uh, you know if we're not resetting if you like then what we're going to do is we're going to um <laughs> i can hear the cat <laughs> you're on the wrong side of the door again you're like a dog um so here we're lo wait a minute we're loading in normal clock divider if one or less so by default we're loading in um 
100 is that 100 in hex no it's hex so it's not 100 that's um oh mm, f f it's fractional divider 16.8 so that's okay all right yeah so we shifted up some bits and we're setting the enable to one otherwise um what we're going to do here is each time we clock through because it's divisional we're not going up by one we're actually going up by 256. um if we get to the highest value i.e if div counter is greater than or equal to what the divider is minus one um then what we do is we reset it back to zero so that we can go back round again okay and then the pn able i.e the new clock output so to speak um is loaded in from the wait a minute it's only if the div counter is less than the divisor shifted by one to the right which is divided by two so half the divisor so as long as the div counter is less than half the divisor which is the initial divide signal um, we set the p enable high at that point i think is that right Laurie? does that explanation work so basically this is dividing the signal the clock signal um, into an output signal on p enable but it's a bit more tricky because it's a fractional clock divider which is why we're going up in amounts of 256 which is eight bits at a time if you like will that keep that now yeah we'll remember that that's good so that's a divider now um in order to get each new instruction for the state machine we need a program counter so let's take a look at the program counter now our program counter here um, is a five bit that's what the 4.4 colon naught means in other words from zero to the fourth bit so there's actually five bits there because it counts from zero um, the which the register that holds that information i.e the current instruction that is pointed to where do you want to go twinks in or out do you want to go out here here no i'm not feeding you you could read what's there you probably want to go out in a minute so uh we're, we're calling it the index the register that points to the current instruction okay it's called index in this case and always um, th this is a combinational assignment so the current value of index is expressed on the d out here which is the same number of bits obviously five bits so that that can be read outside of the uh, program counter bear with me i've got to deal with this cat come on you going out don't think I'm just stand on the threshold. Pets, who'd have her, mate? She's normally really good, actually. Crystal. Um, so, yeah, we can always read the value, current value of what's in the index register by reading the D out five pins here, the five lines. Then again, we've got this synchronous section. So whenever we have a positive clock cycle, again, we've got the reset thing here where we reset index to naught if we've got a high re reset signal. Otherwise, or else if in this case, again, we're looking at that divided clock signal, the P enable, P clock enable. We're also making sure that we're not doing anything when things are stored. So the stored signal has to be low. So we're saying when, we're, when the clock is enabled and um not stored um then we're going to execute this thing here 
So what this is saying here is if jump uh, and jump here is an input signal. It's a one bit signal that's coming from the controller. Um, so if we if that's high, we need to jump to a different position in our instruction memory. So we need to directly set the index here um, from the data in which again is the same number of bits, five bits data in here. So we're directly setting the index register here and that will enable us to jump in memory from whatever instruction we were at before to that new location. So that's when, we, when we're processing a jump instruction, uh, basically this jump signal will be generated in order to enable this to happen. If there isn't a jump signal in all other cases, um, what we're going to do is we are either going to increment the index by one, i.e. move on to the next instruction. Remember, this is a program counter. It counts through the instructions. So go to the next instructions. Unless we've hit the end of all the instructions. So that will either be when we get to the last instruction of all the 32 instructions. But maybe we're not using all of those instructions. And what we want to do is end all those instruction spaces. We are, the end of our program may be somewhere within that 32 bit. In other words, um, we will have a um, program end set here. So when that's the case, we directly read in that program end into the index. Sorry, we the length of the program will be set up at the beginning so that when we see uh, an index value that equals the p end, because normally the p end will be at is it zero or thirty two? I think it'd be thirty two i.e. the end of the normal program. So if that's been set to something less than 32, then what we do is we go back round to zero prematurely. I.e. We don't go all, all the way to the end to the 32nd instruction. We go back to zero. Let me just check what uh, Lai is saying here. We'll probably need a P start here as well as a program can start at an offset and there can also be a wrap target p start program start why would why would we have a p start that isn't at zero when 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 does that happen laurie what causes the p start that isn't zero oh so the entry point wouldn't be zero but there'd be code from zero is what you're saying. So there'd be instructions before the P start. So it joins the program some way down to start with, and then it go, when it goes back to zero, it actually runs the instructions before that. I think that's what uh, Laurie's saying here. And we don't have that support yet in there. Different machines use different portions of the instructions. Oh. Right, because we're sharing the instruction memory between the different state machines. Is that what you mean, Larry? I told you this was going to be interactive. Yeah, so the thing to remember is I take you back to the diagram. Uh, I don't know if we can see it here. Remember, we've actually got four state machines all running from that 32 instruction set. So we could be running one of those pieces, then one of these pieces, one of those, one of those, etc. So we're not quite dealing with that yet in this example is what, um, what Laurie's saying. So we'd have to be able to set the starting place. So we don't just need a P end, we need a P start as well, which isn't in the current uh, Verilog. Uh, Laurie also talks about using the wrap target within a program.
What's the wrap target used for? Is that so it doesn't start at zero? Sorry. Yeah. So if you don't want to start at zero, and again, that's not supported because we don't have a P start. So, you know, next week or whatever, we may have a P start as well to be able to do that. So presumably that means we can only run one state machine at the moment. Sorry. Yeah, cool. OK, so that's our program counter. Um, next, let's have a look at the shifters. Now, in this case, I know on this diagram it says shift in and shift out, but we have a common set of Verilog code describing the logic for both. I don't know whether that's true actually in the hardware or not. That's not really indicated here, but then scratch X and scratch Y isn't indicated in that way. It's just, but it is kind of assumed because they've got the same name. I mean, there could be some optimization if your out shift was different from your in shift. Uh, it might be more code, but it might take up slightly less resources for each one of them. I don't know what you think on that, uh, Laurie. But Laurie's implementation went for a single shifter that could be either an out shift or an in shift. However, within the hardware itself, we don't know if it does that or whether it has individual pieces of hardware that are tailored for shifting in or shifting out, i.e. they're subtly different. Um, I haven't tested shift in shift yet. So if we look at the uh, shifter, um, thinking about it, how can I? Oh, let's unlock it. I unlock it, I can then um, change the size of the window. You see, on here, um, is that why we had to go to 64-bit uh, wide um, register in order so it could do shift in both directions? Laurie? Yeah. So in other words, our shifter register, the main register inside where the information is getting shifted, is twice as big as it needs to be to be able to accomplish shifting in one direction or in the other. Because we effectively start in the middle and where we place it determines whether it's a shift left or shift right. So if it's something we want to shift left, we might have it in the lower significant part and the other way around, we'd have it in the most significant part for its initialization. So yeah, this register size would be half the size for each of a shift in, shift out if they were separate pieces of code, for example. Uh, so it may result in less transistors, potentially. Laurie uh, <laughs> says this Quite a delay before you see my replies. Yeah, there probably is, Laurie. I don't know how long the round trip takes. Uh, other implementations are possible. Indeed, there are a lot of ways of skinning these particular cats. Uh, and when we get into the MIGEN stuff, probably next week, you'll see it's entirely different again. And the way that I've thought about breaking some of these things down is different. Um, I am trying to keep it similar in some ways as I'm looking at... Um, Laurie's code because it just makes it easier but uh, long term they may um, diverge somewhat yeah could probably use 32 bit registers obviously if, they'd, if they were different you could get away with using 32 bit registers and extend it to 64 bits just when you do the shift um, yeah, so this is actually quite complicated because it does both left and right shift. But let's have a go at looking at this. So um, so we've got the shift register itself that's holding the data that's being shifted, which is a 64-bit register. 
Then we have a register called count, which is used to count the position, the number of shifts that we've done effectively. Um, we've then got a wire here, really. So what this is, again, this is a uh, this is syntactic sugar for doing a combination, defining a wire, which is the output of a combinational relationship. And what this is saying, depending on the DIR input, which comes in here, that tells us whether we're going to shift left or right. So depending on whether that's high or low, we will either do a shift, you know, one direction or shift the other direction. In this case here, we're seeing a, a right shift by shift number of bits. <coughs> and if DIR is zero, then we're going to do a left shift by shift number of bits. Okay. <clears throat> so that's a combinational piece of logic expressed with a name called new shift, which is just a wire in our parallel. And then we've got our familiar bit again. So here what we've got is some um, synchronous logic that's based on the clock. Cat's back and wants to go through. Uh, the first thing we've got is the reset section. So again, if we're re if we're if we've got a reset signal, um, we're going to set our internal shift register value to zero, zero out, and we're going to set our uh, count to 32, which is in the centre of that 64-bit um, reg. Or are we counting down? Hold on, we're yeah, it's complicated. Oh, that logic's not nice. And we get down there. Otherwise, if we're not resetting and we are not stalled and our clock is enabled, if we're setting, so in other words, we've got a high set signal coming in here, um, we're going to go and do this particular section. So here what it's saying is if the DIR is high, the direction is high, in other words, we're shifting right, um, the shift register, which is where we're our local state of the shift, uh, will receive a new value, which is determined by this concatenation on the right here. Uh, and the concatenation is all the D input bits, 32 bits wide, whatever the data is in. So we're loading in a value to set up the shift register. And then we're adding in another 32 zeros to the least significant part of the register. Because it's 64 bit wide, we've got 32 bit zeros, then we've got our number and the next 32 bits on the most significant bits. Um, otherwise, if the direction is left shift, i.e. DIR is zero, then we'll do our, we will concatenate our data such that we have 32 most significant bits which are set to zero, then our data that's presented on the 32 bits or the input here on the least significant bits. Um, also here we're going to set our count value to bit count. Now bit count is provided by um, six bits that come from the controller here which tells us how much how many bits we're going to shift each time? Is that correct? Yes. Is that the right thing, Laurie? Is that the number of bits we're shifting, the bit count? Uh, whatever. Um, so if we're not doing a set instruction, we're actually doing the shift, shifting itself. Oh, sorry, Lloyd just corrected me here. No, it's the initial count in the instruction required. Okay, it's not the number of bits we're shifting. Sorry. It's the initial count of shifts. So far, if we want to set that. Um, 
So if we're not doing the set, then we're actually probably doing the shifting. So what it's saying here, if we get a do shift signal, which is a one bit signal coming in from the control here, what it says is our shift register will be updated with the new shift value. And new shift was that um, combinational output from this formula up here, which is the actual shift, whether it's a shift left or right, depending on the DIR direction. So that actually performs a shift and outputs that. So on this clock cycle, we're just shifting that into the new value of the shift register, i.e. the new shifted value. Uh, count in this case then um, also needs to be updated because we need to add uh, shift the value of shift oh crikey this is a bit complicated Okay, so what it's saying here, let me just try and understand this. This logic is if the count plus shift is greater than 32, then it's going to set the count to 32. Otherwise, it will set it to count plus shift. So that stops it overflowing. That maxes out at 32. That's what that's doing. And Laurie's just saying here, uh, I might have bit count wrong. Okay, so there may be a bit of an error in there. Um, there's also some other stuff going on down here. These are sign statements, again, are combinational statements. So the, um, the assign here is just making shift count always be the same as what count is. Okay, because shift count is an output here. So that can be read by the controller downstream. There's a six bit signal that reflects what the current value of count is so that you can see what the count is um, because the controller needs that for part of the state machine and the instruction execution. Um, the assign here for the digital out. So what we're not doing here is constantly showing uh, what the shift register is like we have on the other examples that we've that we've dove into, driven into, <laughs> drilled down on. Uh, it's a bit more complex here. So first of all, it depends on whether we're shifting left or right. So if we're shifting right, then the value will be this one here. Um, so it would be new shift, which is the output of this here. So the shifted value, which itself is shifted by the 32 bits normally. Because remember, we're sitting at the most significant 32 bits in a 64 bit register, not a 32 bit register. So we have to shift that back down by 32 bits um to align that with the 32 bit output but it's not just 32 bits because we've actually been shifting it right so the number of shifts we've shifted right have to be taken away from that 32 bits so it's not just 32 bits that shifted so in other words we're tracking it okay and then if the ir is zero i shift left then we have something that's even more funky and horrible looking. Damn. Um, so the new shift value, in this case, we're only looking at the most significant bits, i.e. bits 32 to 64. So 63 is inclusive here. Um, and then what we're doing is we're shifting that left by 32 bits minus whatever the uh, shift that has occurred so far. But also that whole output is then shifted right 
by 32 bits minus the shift. It's complicated logic, but that's a lot of this is down to us using a 64-bit register and input and outputting at 32 bits, plus accounting for the shift that we've done. Woo! Yeah, that's tricky. Um, I'm surprised I've still got this many viewers. Let me know if this is too complex because I can go over it slightly less if you like. But this, a lot of the uh, logic work, Verilog type stuff, you're working down at this low level. So that's what a shifter does. And that can do either the right or the left shift. So it's one piece of Verilog to handle with both, both cases, um, depending on the way it's programmed on the input, you know, the direction controls, whether it's being a left or right shift, etc. Let me just catch up with the chat. So, um, yeah, the shift count is mainly used for auto pull and auto push. Now, these are ways where the FIFO gets automatically emptied or filled um, rather than manually emptied or filled based on the shift amount and its capacity in the DMA buffer, which is uh, normally four 32 bit um words um but they can be combined if you only go in tx or rx you can combine the two fours into one eight um but the number of shifts you can do in or out of that will be dependent you know it can be calculated so when you're doing this kind of auto pull and auto push in the instructions or in the configuration of the instructions for the data um you can account for that and that's partly what the shift count is being used for so that the controller can calculate the necessary um, amount of shifting and decoding that that requires or realigning that that requires and count when it needs to move things along um, those shifts ensure zeros in the most significant bits he says and i also says again there may be a better algorithm um so if the amount of shifted is above a configurable threshold then the auto pull or push is done yeah i think making the shifter be able to do left or right shift makes that logic slightly more complex in the implementation and slightly harder to understand would be my guess but you know there's kind of code savings if you're into a code looking at it from a code reuse point of view it may be more sensible in terms of the resources you'd use in terms of transistors for example uh, if it was you were making a ship that did it it might not be so sensible because you might use more transistors for example or if you're worried about the number of lookup tables you might be using in an fpga you might have the same concern so you know there are different ways of skinning this depending on which way you look at it uh, direction is a global setting for the state machine. Right. So it doesn't change dynamically then, Laurie? I'm guessing. Well, in this case, no, because it would normally be a right shifter or a left shifter. So it would normally be separate. If you look at this diagram here, their assumption is... But anyhow, so that's our shifters. Uh, so we've done the program counters, etc. Um, the other things we've got here are the FIFOs, the other you know low-level modules. I think with the MyGen version, I mean I'm I'm replicating or something similar in my MyGen for compatibility reasons but in mmigen for example there are already some very well tested fifos and there are all sorts of different options that are suitable for different types of applications depending what you're fifoing between and whether you need to use say block rams or not in the fpga yeah instructions don't specify which shift direction is um
is what Laurie's saying. Even though that logic can do that, it's just not the way it's designed. So let's have a look at the FIFOs. Um, let me unlock this, I can make it a bit bigger. So what do we have here? Again, we've got one of those. Uh, no, hold on. Wait a minute, this isn't the code, is it? So the FIFOs currently have the wrong code. Damn, that's annoying. So the FIFOs look like shifters. That's weird. That's annoying. So how did I do that then? How did I end up with those? How did the FIFO end up with the um, shift to code in them? Hold on a sec. How does a block shift down? Like a Hmm. Okay. <sighs> I can't remember how to get rid of things from within iStudio either. <laughs> there is no delete. There's only cut. But you can't seem to cut these. I mean, I if I do that, maybe I can cut. Ta da Yeah, there we go. Because those are wrong. So let's, um, whilst we're at it, let's show you how to create a block. So let's, because obviously in my prep, I miscopied something. Somehow I ended up with shifters instead of FIFOs. So let me show you how we create those. So we create a code block. Hold on. Save as file save. So, how you create a new block is basically it's just like a new project in iStudio. So, we do a code block here. So, the first thing we have to do is we have to work out what our input and outputs are. So, for the FIFO, we have a clock input and we have a reset input. And we have a push, a pull. We also have a uh, data in, which is a 32-bit signal. So that's expressed in the Verilog fashion. And we have a It in. and we have a that's all our inputs and then we have a data out sorry which again is a 32 bit output we also have uh, empty Flag, so we can notify the controller that we are empty. That's important because you don't want to pull from an empty FIFO. That's a store situation, and the controller needs to know that. Uh, we also need full because the controller needs to know if a FIFO is full, not to put any more data in it from the shifter if it's shifting out. That should do us. And then we need the code. So let me just go and grab that minus all of the module stuff from Norris source just make that a bit smaller 
Okay, so let's have a look at FIFOs. Quite often, um, FIFOs are... They can be tricky things, depending on what you're trying to achieve. But they're very good interfaces. They're very good for interfacing between two different clock domains. What do I mean by two different clock domains? I mean things that are operant, operating under two separate clocks that run at different frequencies that aren't necessarily related. Uh, they provide an asynchronous means of buffering in between those two. So they're very common, commonly used. Uh, and the FIFO stands for first in, first out. So I put it in one end and then it comes out the other end in the order I put it in, effectively. Um, so our signals here, push, pushes into the FIFO, pull, pulls out from the FIFO. Uh, and data in is the input, data out is the output from those. Clock, we've already covered before, reset, etc. And then the empty and full are outputs that signals that indicate to the controller when there are issues such as the FIFO is full up or the FIFO is empty. Um, so what do we have? So locally we have some registers for storing uh, information. Um, we've got the main register which which basically holds a 32-bit uh, data but it doesn't just hold one of those it holds four of those. So we have this array it's, we've actually called it AR, or Laurie's actually called it ARR here, or you might use something like a memory, like a block memory, for example, which is basically, rather than just individual lookup tables being used as registers, you could use more bulk memory so that you don't use your lookup tables. And this is the array subscript. So what we're saying here is naught to three is that we actually need four memory locations. So we've got four lots of 32-bit registers. That's effectively what we're saying here. Um, the synthesizer may interpret that and use memories instead of registers, depending on what we're using to do this. Um, we've also got a two-bit register here to represent uh, the address within that buffer, let's say in that array, uh, the index point, if you like, where where the first is, and a similar size register where the last is. Um, the terminology you might be more familiar with in terms of programming is uh, first would be the head pointer, last would be the tail pointer. And then we've also got a free bit register, which can tell you how many entries you've got in your uh, DMA buffer. Sorry, in your FIFA buffer. I'm missing the assigns. Oh, yeah, that may be. Uh, yep, yeah, sorry. Thank you. My bad. That was a bad copy. Because we need those in a minute as well. Um, so let's tackle the reset part again. So again, we've got a synchronous part of code here that happens on the positive edge of the clock. Um, when we are sent a reset signal, we are resetting the first, last, and counts all to zero. That's all that's saying. Um, Otherwise, if we've got a push and not a full, sorry, yeah, if we've got a push signal and we are not full, okay, um, then we can execute the push here. To execute that, we first increment our last or tail pointer. So we set that to the whatever it was before plus one. Um, we then update the register or the array location index by last slash head uh, with the cont contents of data in on this bus, this 32 bit data here, and we increment the count because we've added another piece into the FIFO buffer. So we take the existing count, we add one to it, and we put it back in the count register. Um, if it's not a push and uh, or we weren't full or we were full, 
then we're going to look at this piece of code and what this says sorry this piece of logic and we're going to say if it's a pull request uh, and we are not empty because you can't pull from an empty FIFA yeah if, if you pulled everything out already there's nothing left in there or what is in there will, will not make sense so we will then execute we will output the contents uh, the next contents from the FIFO. So we're going to increment our first or what might be head in a normal kind of um, C type code. And then we're going to decrement the counter because we're doing the opposite. We're taking out now. So we've got less entries in our buffer, in our array, in our FIFO. Um, so we're taking the count, taking one off it and setting that back into account. So it's quite simple synchronous logic there, but the other things that we've got going on. So we've got some combinational stuff going on down here. So this is happening constantly. Um, our empty is determined by whether count equals zero. So if we keep pulling out after having filled our FIFO, count will eventually get down to zero. Um, that will mean that the empty is true so what this is saying is empty will be true if count equals zero otherwise empty will be low okay uh, and then for full what we're saying is when we filled up our entire buffer remember it's four four 32-bit registers or 32-bit entries into our array or memory so when the count has been added up to four, we, that means we've done four pushes without any subsequent pulls, for example, then we know that this is going to be full. Otherwise, the full logic signal is going to be zero. And then what we're doing is our output always points to the current first in the array or the, or the, um, the head. Of the FIFO. Okay. Is it clear? Any questions on that one? Let me just scroll this down actually because that should be a bit bigger. So it's actually a very simple FIFO. There are all sorts of other clever things you can do in the FIFO to do with mixing clock domains and stuff, enabling it to use certain kinds of memories in FPGAs as opposed to registers. Um, etc. So I can now, uh, what I need to do actually is I need to save this. I wonder if I can overwrite the existing FIFO save. Already exists? Yes. I want to overwrite it. The other thing I need to do is set the, um, when you make a block in um, iStudio um, then you need to give it some metadata which you'd normally have from the actual module definition by the way um, and they like to give you you can have an, add a nice little icon SVG icon it's actually a bit awkward that it's SVGs but there you go uh, downloads have I got something what did I use before to use registers? Let's use that. Cool. So I now save that. So we've created a red uh, a FIFO block now because the one I created before was rubbish. So I somehow managed to put the um, shifter code in it. So we can now open back up our. Um, previous a current stream project and I can get rid of this one so I can switch back to that and now we can back re-add those back in so add as a block let's take the FIFOs 
hopefully these will be the right ones now. I'll be really peed off if they're not. And another one. So we need two. Let's just see if they are what we just told them to be. Yes, very good. Fixed. Right, so uh, we now have some FIFOs in our diagram. So we have the components we need. The only thing that's missing now. Oh, excuse me. It's something to tie all these together. And this is interesting point, really. And this is where trying to use iStudio to do this entirely falls apart. Because what you'd normally do here is you'd have a state machine module that then includes these various parts of the state machine, right? And in fact, if you were to look at the code that Laurie's written, that's exactly what he does in the code. Whereas in this diagram, it seemed to be magically done by the control image and this invisible block around it. Now, you can't put one inside another in iStudio, so we're a bit stuffed there. But what we could do, possibly, and this is the bit that I haven't scripted at all because I wasn't sure how we we're going to do it. So can we um, I created a block that could represent the controller here. Let me just double check what's in here. So I've got all of the IOs, but I haven't put any of the very log in here, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, Laurie is saying, um, I have a machine module and a decode module to implement the control logic. That's right. Um, and I have, I think I added in a block to handle the decoding here. So our controller is already made up of two parts. Um, so let's have a look at the decoder because um, this is quite interesting. So if we go back to our instructions. All these instructions need to be decoded. They're actually binary instructions. So what the assembler will do is it will take our written code and it will actually create binary, 16-bit binary codes representing each instruction, up to 32 of them. Um, and then the decoder is responsible for translating that to a degree. So in uh, the model that Laurie has produced in his Verilog, he actually has a module called decoder for this. A slightly different for the way I do it in, in my um, model, but again, there are other ways of implementing different things. But let's have a look at it. So um, the interesting thing to look at here is if we look at, I might need to, at this here. So if we look here, we're breaking down these instruction sets. Um, I mean, in order to see that, I'm going to have to hmm. I'm having some trouble squeezing these onto the screen. Bear with me. Let me just fiddle with the boundaries. Oof. Maybe if I go a slightly different route here. Sorry, I'm fiddling with OBS at the moment, guys and girls. Moving stuff around. 
to try and get everything on the screen that we need. Uh, can I squeeze that a bit more? Hold on. That's about it. So this might be a bit more difficult to read. Bear me one moment. Uno momento, s'il vous plaît. Okay. I think it squeezes everything in. Do you see everything now? So here we've got the instruction set from the data sheet pdf and then here we've got the code now i don't know if i can make that a bit bigger can you actually read that code guys because it's quite small trying to fit everything on the screen um so if you're looking at the instructions here, what our decode is saying? So for example, we're breaking up these pieces of code, we're breaking it into sections. So uh, the section at the top, the operation part, if you like, that determines which, which, um, which instruction is present, we're using bits 13 through to 15 inclusive. So it's these three bits here. You see, they're all different for all the instructions, apart from push and pull, which have the same ones. So that's so when we're when we're doing our combinational piece of logic here, op represents those top three bits. This is um, what do you call this in Verilog? In um, in Mmigen, you call it slicing. In Verilog, you call it bit fielding or whatever. So we're only taking the top three bits the most significant three bits from the instruction uh, and we're copying those into something represented by the name op think of it as three wires then op one we are looking at bits five through to seven which is these ones here so for example that will tell us the difference between push and pull it will also tell us the difference between certain parts of an operation so in the jump for example that gives us uh, what the condition is those bits represent the condition um, for an in instruction that would represent the source i.e the index of the source okay um, and then for op2 we're looking at instructions naught through to four so that's the least significant five bits here. Um, so for example, for the jump instruction, it would be the address we're jumping to, i.e. the index of the instruction that we're jumping to. Um, in other cases, for the in, it will be the bit count. Um, and for a set, it will be the data field, i.e. The, um, the bits. Then the delay and the side side sets have to be extracted in a slightly more complex fashion because the bits eight through to 12 on this diagram here, these five bits represent both delay and side set in combination. So we have a more complex extraction of the information from those bits here in order to evaluate what they represent in terms of a delay and side sets. Remember the side sets are the bits where we're setting another thing as well as the instruction is setting. So we can set two things at once, say a, a data out pin and a clock or a data in pin and a clock. Um, so in this case, if we look at delay, 
what that's doing is it's taking bits 8 through 12 and it's shifting that by the total number of, of side sets here uh, to to the left because we're only interested in the side set number of bits side set total number of bits so it'll shift everything out um, and then once it's done that we shift that back to get it down to zero uh, to get it aligned to the LSB uh, the side set detail is taken <sighs> so we we work out where the side set enable bit is so where in these bits that sits and we shift the 8 to 12 bits that much then with that we shift it down by where the position of the side bit is number of bits and then the number of delay bits which is quite complicated um, the side set enabled is set by the side set enable bit and the 12 bit of the instruction i.e. the top bit of the delay side set um, and if side set enable bit isn't being used then we set it to one don't quite understand that bit that's in a bit deeper than I understand at this point um, Laurie Griffiths is saying MSB is an optional side set enable which specifies whether a side set applies to the instruction okay deep into the way that side sets work here but anyhow so the responsibility of this module or block in this case is really for breaking down that 16 bit word into its component parts and derived parts that can then be used by the controller logic in order to execute the instruction That's effectively what's going on here. Um, and again, it's using what's going on at the top here. These are combinational sets. So delay bits itself is always five minus the side set total. Because it will be offset by that number of bits. Um, and side set total is always always adds in the side set enable bit mm, trying to understand that that's where the side set total comes from wow that's quite involved it's a global setting um if not set every instruction does a side set okay I did say that the side set stuff really does complicate the this state machine. Even in decode, it makes it complex. So this is the decoder. Right. So going back to where we were. Um, So that's the decoder down here. And then we have something that hasn't yet been defined, which is the controller. And there is no code in here. Now, the reason that there is no code in here is because it will need to be extracted. Um, because the way it's constructed with Laurie's Verilog is the controller isn't separate. It's actually formed by what's called a state machine that has all of the code in it or the, the Verilog for this. Um, and then it itself has instances of the other modules inside it. 
which you can't easily draw. Um, on um, my studio. Hold on, let me just get this realigned. This is really I've got something weird going on here. Bear with me, I'm just trying to get these things aligned. That's better. I can actually see it now. So even though I have all my inputs and outputs defined here, I don't have any code in it. So what we have to do, or what we effectively have to do here to understand this is selectively um, pull those in from the file called machine.veridog. Um, but I think we're a bit short of time now. How long have we been going? 22, 40. Yeah, we're already, I've probably got another 10 minutes and then I need to call it a day, which probably won't be long enough for this. Um, decoder is purely combinational as every instruction executes in one cycle. In other words, it doesn't have to wait for a clock sync in order to change or an enable clock sync in this case. So yeah. So it's, you can actually replace it. I mean, I think in my um, M Mygen, I have that inside uh, the same part. So it's just uh, a bunch of combinational. It's a combinational array of instructions uh, of logic. So um, can we put any of that in here? So effectively, what we're talking about here is before I put any code in here because it's difficult to understand there are this is the largest portion of the code for the state machine because it has to calculate things like the delays um, and it has to calculate um, all the side sets and it has to execute all the instructions and the largest part of that is the execution of the instructions um, and in order to put that in this block in this way i need to change it if i was to take out that piece um, and put it in here it would complain bitterly because it's referring to parts that don't exist in the controller. Uh, so, for example, if we were to look at the instruction part, there's a lot to it. If I try to do a verify, it would complain that certain things are just not there. I don't know why it's talking about the PCF file. It's rather weird. Um, so these are all defined. Oh, crikey. Uh, I don't think putting these in is a good idea, but it will give us some um, heads up on this. enough so that we can have a little peek at what's going on under the hood here hmm. so um basically this is all combinational so it happens in real time 
sparing delays in the logic rather than synchronously. So when you see this at the top, rather than seeing the at, always at with the pause edge of clock, you're seeing always at star is the same as a very large assign. Assign is really syntactic sugar for this. And what that means is always at, and because it's using star, that's saying when any of the things referred to in here changes, not at any clock cycle, when anything that is used in the logic here changes, reevaluate this logic. So this is kind of always, always, but at a very fine grain at the speed of the logic. Um, forget that we're resetting all of these. But basically, remember when we saw the decode signal? So we've now got the op. That's the top three bits of that decode signal. The decode module or block is providing us with that op those three bits so the first thing this does this is like a huge great big case statement okay which is like a switch in c and these cases are the different settings of those three bits i.e representing the different instructions so when op equals what jump is now in this case jump let me show you what that looks like because uh, i didn't copy that into it as well and i should have done my bad the way that's done in verilog is using a local parameter in this case it's not the only way of doing it that's the way that um, it's been done. Uh, by um, Laurie in this case. So here we define what jump is. So in binary, that would be 0, 0, 0. This instruction weight would be 0, 0, 1. In would be zero one zero, out would be one one one, push would be uh sorry, out would be zero one one, push would be one one one, pull would be one one one, and move would be uh what am I saying? What am I saying? No, that'd be zero one zero zero sorry, one zero zero and pull would be one zero zero, move would be one zero one. And then IQ will be one one zero, and then set will be one one one. So we've got duplication on here for the push and pull because they have the same codes. Remember, if you remember from the instructions, on the right here. um i'm just reading the comments here yeah all of this here why are we setting all these values to zero these are values that can be changed by this logic okay so what we're doing here is you're always setting them to zero um, when you express logic in something like verilog you have to account for all of the cases that you're not accounting for if you see what i mean so what this is saying is if any of these aren't set using any of these branches in the case set them to zero uh, if we then so for example jump is set to zero here but if we have a jump command jump will actually be set to something else so the last verilog entry in this going down is the one that sticks but if there isn't one then it will default to zero um, if you don't include these what the synthesis tool does i.e., the thing that will try and comprehend your logic from 
the Verilog that you've written, is it will use, it will imply that you will have these signals latched. And a latch just retains the value of what it was before. So in other words, if you haven't changed the value, it will be what it was before. And all values will be zero by default to start with if you haven't defined them elsewhere. So this prevents the synthesizer implying that this is latch because you're being explicit. When anything changes, these are all reset to zero or they're set by the relevant cases on each instruction. That's a complicated area of Verilog. If you, if you know HDL, you'll probably already understand all of this. It's quite difficult if you're coming across from a programming uh, language rather and you're used to compiling rather than synthesis. Um, and there are some subtleties in um, in in what you write in Verilog to create the right logic. Um, and the synthesizer will imply things if you don't account for them properly, particularly in cases or it, it, in terms of when you're using case statements or, or case synthesis, should I say, uh, because cases are really just muxes. Anyhow, let's let's just forget about that for a moment. So let's assume that we've got a jump instruction. So our value is 001, or is it 000, I can't remember. Oh yes, 000 here. Then it knows it's got a jump instruction. So in executing that, it has to do something. So first of all, it records the value of OP2. Remember, OP2 is the other digits. Um, what was OP2, was it? Five, six, and seven. Mm -hmm. no, hold on, let me just cheat and look at the decoder. OP2 is bits 0 through to 4. 0 through to 4 here. So that's the address for the jump instruction. So the new value here, which is a generic, just temporary register storage, is saying, is recording what the value of OP2 is. So the one of the operands is the address of where we jump to. So that's storing where we're going to jump to because it's going to need that later. Um, by the way, uh, Laurie's saying this logic could be referred to as a sequencer. Okay. Um, yeah. And it's very unlike a state machine in that regard, which is why calling it a state machine is actually not doing it justice. But anyhow, um, so having done that, so it's got the address. Now it's going to look at the OP1 details. Now the OP1 part of the instruction is based on the... Um, Bits five through seven, five through seven, which is five through seven, which is in this case, it's a condition for the jump. Is that correct? Yes. So there are different types of jump. Okay. So if the value of zero P one, i.e. bits five through to seven are zero, then it just sets jump to one. So it activates the jump line. Remember jump is an output line. Hold on. Do we have it on the side here that goes to the program counter? So this is effectively sending a signal to the program counter PC jump. I've called it something different here because I need to know how to wire it. But it's actually this pin. Um, so it would take that high. So that is basically always jumping. That's like a hard jump. Um, the second case where the 
op1 value sub sub part of the instruction is um equal is equal to one then what it does is it looks at register x remember the scratch register so it reads the value in from x i'm not showing how that's done here because it's done in another part of this verilog which i haven't pasted in yet and if x is equal to zero um so well x in this case is yeah uh it's a scratch x is equal to zero then it will set the jump high initiate the jump to whatever the label is or the address it in the instruction um, if the op1 value is 2 then and x is not equal to naught it will then decrement the value of x so it's counting down the scratch x register here so it's in decrement mode countdown mode um, and jump won't be set. Um, if it's OP1 free, so if OP1 is free, then you have a similar thing, but using the Y register, the Y scratch register as its source or as it's decrementing. And then for OP1 setting five, if x is not equal to y so it's a comparison so if you're saying if the scratch value in x is different from scratch value in y then you're setting the jump so it's a difference type comparison type jump uh, six equals jump pin and i can't remember what that is Lloyd might give me a clue with that one um, and then seven jump osr count is less than osr threshold osr what was the osr shift register output shift register count has met has has shifted enough for the preset output shift register threshold number of shifts um, so after so many shifts then it will do the jump set by the threshold of the shift oh this is we're in deep this is complicated but you can see how this is all formed with various different bits of logic you can configure a pin as a jump pin that's what that is configure a pin as a jump pin so the jump is triggered by the state of the pin is that what you mean now The jump instruction then only jumps if that pin is set. Yeah, so if that pin goes high, then the jump is executed. Yeah, so that's the jump instruction uh, execution. Then we have the wait instruction. Um, this time we're not using the OP2 register to store an address. Um, we're looking at bit one. So the two bits of op1 so let's just remember what op1 is op1 is bits 5 through to 7 bits 5 through to 7 is um what are we on wait second one down bits 5 through to 7 that's these so we've got pole and source so the lower two bits of the source and the upper bit is pole is that for polarity so anyhow so weight here is saying so in this case it's just reading the lower two bits and it's ignoring the pole effectively and it's saying if those are zero weighting equals gpi o pins crikey index by op2 op2 which is bits 4 to naught are not equal to op1 uh index 2 damn so this is looking for a specific bit pattern on the gpio pins um uh 
P1, 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 That's the upper bit of the instructions, which is the polarity. So if that GPIO pin isn't that polarity, test of a pin equals the polarity. Thank you. <laughs> Save the effort. Sorry. Yes, I'm working it back from basic principles here. I'm not as familiar with your code as you are. Waiting <laughs> input when it's one. So when OP1.01 is one. Input pins OP2 again are not equal to OP12. These are input pins rather than GPIO pins. You mean output versus input. So these are inputs versus output. Test if pin equals the polarity. Okay, and then two IRQ flags. Ooh, that's complicated. There are two versions of the input pins. Okay. Um, and then the IRQ flags, IRQ index is equal to pin two. Okay, so Laurie's saying there are two versions of the input pins. One is the absolute pin numbers, and the other is the PIO mapping, which is the MUX. Okay. And then the IRQ one here is saying if there is an IRQ set for the IRQ index of this pin set, presumably, um, is not equal to the um, polarity of OP1. Okay. Um, at this point, I'm not sure. Should we do? Because uh, I'm out of time now. I'm going to have to finish it. Now we can come back and do this next week and go through the other instructions. We can also look at how we start wiring these things up and converting this. Um, But I think I'm going to call it a day now because we've been going long. So we can either come back to this next time or we can look in at a higher level because this is still only part of what we're doing in the in the um, state machine. This is just the instruction, the instruction execution. There are other bits as well, calculating the delay and the set bits, etc. And dealing with the muxing and stuff, which we need to look at. So I'll probably keep this as is for the moment. So to save your design, you need to look. Okay, well, I'll come back to that. So we've done the jump and wait. We need to remember that for last time. Let me just see what's happening in the chat here. Um, I post to ask which ones are which when referring to the different ways of referring to the GPIOs. Um, Laurie said, I think GPIO underscore pins is the absolute GPIO pin number. Um, Laurie's now saying, um, not all this code is tested, so there may be many bugs. Ideally, it will be formally verified. Yeah, let's not go there. Let's not start that conversation yet, because this is the end of the stream, not the beginning. That will be worth several streams on its own, I think. Anyhow, this is a good point to call it. Um, let me know in the chat or down on Discord or wherever you prefer as to what we do next time. Whether we continue diving in deeper with this um, to carry on doing the instructions and then the other bit, or whether we move on to an end margin. I think it'd be good to come back to this actually, because this is good stuff. Right, any questions as I'm finishing off now? Anything that people would like to know? 
about what we've covered so far. Um, yeah, it's dinner time, says I post. Maybe in Florida. We already had ours. Our pizza tonight. <laughs> Laurie says it's bedtime. <laughs> yeah, the UK here, it's what? Uh, 11 o'clock. So, yeah. This is about the time I start losing my marbles on the stream because it's late. I'm all right coding at this time, but uh, yeah, streaming, I get to a point where I'm just uh, getting tired. Anyhow, we can do more of this next time. I'm glad this is useful to everyone. Um, we'll continue the deep dive and I think we'll continue where we left off here uh, next week. Um, the only other possibility is maybe if I have more time, I could do some more on another day this week, an extra stream. But I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys know. It that depends on a lot of things because I've got quite a bit of stuff to do. Um, hope this is useful so far. Hope this is interesting. I hope everybody on the stream hasn't completely fallen asleep. I, I still see some some people interacting with it. It is quite deep. Uh, so thanks for sticking with us on this. Um, and um, we will carry on and do some more. I hope it's given you some insight into how you construct something like the PIOs. This is a great way to learn how they work, by the way, because, you know, in order to build something, you have to understand it, right? So this is a great way of diving in. But anyhow, so let's leave it now. So... Ciao, guys. Thank you. And um, meet us in the next stream. You can talk to us down at the forum or on Discord. Uh, I look forward to interacting and uh, catching up next time. Cheers, guys and girls. Bye.